This is my father's world. Isn't that beautiful? Our homes are so important, and that's why we have the family conference, I know, but Celeste and her family are coming to sing a song called God Bless Our Home. all around us are crumbling every day, yielding to the enemy and throwing life away. Bind our lives together, guide us with your truth. When the struggle seems too great, Lord, keep our eyes on you. Lord, bless our home, protect our home. Let it be a refuge in this world of sin. Lord, reign within. Keep us strong and true. And when we need you most, Lord, draw us close. Come near to do each other. Lord, bless our home. We give our home to you. for your goodness our love was in your plan help us face the future always trusting in your hand keep us warm and tender keep us clean and pure drive us to each other's arms and make our love and truth Lord bless our home protect our home. Let it be a refuge in this world of sin. Lord, reign within. Keep us strong and true. And when we need you most, Lord, draw us close. Commit to each other. Lord, bless our home. We give our home to you. Listen, little children, our God is in control. He can move a mountain even when your faith is small. So give your hearts to Jesus. Praise Him every day. He knows every step you'll take. He'll guide you on your way. Lord, bless our home, protect our home. Let it be a refuge in this world of sin. Lord, reign within. Keep us strong and true. And when we need you most, Lord, draw us close. Commit to each other. Lord, bless our home. We give our home to you. Lord bless our home, Lord bless our home. Ever a song that would signify this whole family conference, it would be that right there. Lord bless our home, please bless our home. And that's what every home in here needs. You may, you may be the best family God ever made. But God still wants to bless your home, and you ought to want God to bless your home. And so, and so I don't know about you, but I, the Lord has spoken to my heart, and I'm ready for God to do that again in my heart tonight. So uh, Brother Morris Gleiser is going to come again to us. And, and if you are not here this morning at all, whether you was teaching Sunday school or teaching children's church, raise your hand. All right, good. Well, you guys are in for a treat. What a great preacher he is. And, uh, and, uh, and I won't say anything about his love of cats. He'll probably do that himself. But anyways, he's going to come again and uh, preach to us. So, Brother Glass, you come on now. And uh, listen up this, uh, this evening once again. God bless you, brother. You, sir. I don't think I've ever been introduced with the love of cats. I've never had a connection with them at all. For all you cat lovers, don't be mad, and, and, and uh, please come back. I really do want you to come back again. Uh, but uh, I do tend, my wife tells me, Morris, when you do that, it's not funny. And I just keep doing it. I make little comments about them all the, along the way. I don't know what it is. But anyway, I'm, I, where am I ch chasing that one? Folks, hasn't the music tonight been outstanding? I'm just telling you, it has just been incredible. My heart is overflowing tonight. 
I mean, it's just been outstanding. I know that because of time, they probably limited the, uh, the handbell choir to one song, and I appreciate that, uh, the fact they're giving me maybe a little more time, and they cut them back for a song. But, man, I just wanted to hear another one. That was just absolutely fantastic. The choir, just incredible, wonderful. And then John's offertory was, was out of sight. This is my father's world. And then this sweet family up here, I couldn't, I don't want to embarrass the little buddy, but I'm telling you, I just loved looking at him as he was singing up there. He was almost, you couldn't almost see him over the music stand, but uh, I, I could catch him. And, and I, I just, just, I just love the words of that good song. The music has just been a home run tonight. Can I just use that? Maybe I should say a grand slam. It's just been outstanding. It's just been very, very good. And I'm grateful, so very grateful for you being here tonight. Now, I didn't see... Uh, the hands that were just raised. So if you were in a children's church, a teen church, or you were just not here this morning, and you and I are looking at each other for the very first time, would you hold up your hand again? You were not here in the morning service. Well, wonderful. Good to see you. Good to have you. I'm sorry you weren't here with us. We need a note from your mother as to where you've been. And uh, <laughs> you, you, you were busy, I'm sure, with other things going on with a bus church, a teen church, and children's church, and, and recovering buses, and whatever it is that you were involved with this morning. We had a time. I was so grateful to see the folks respond for salvation this morning, and so grateful to see the tender heart of you as a church congregation. Folks, I've lived long enough, and I've been in the ministry long enough. Can I just, I mean this with all my heart. I... I do not want in any way to just go through the motions of the ministry any, in, in any way. I'm not interested in just having another church service because, well, hey, it's time to have another church service. I have no interest in having another meeting at a church. I said this morning I'm usually involved with revival meetings. I'm not interested in just having another revival meeting or a family conference as we're having this week. I'm not interested in just going through the routine and the motions. My prayer is that these days will be fundamental in helping us get a biblical focus on what the Word of God truly, what God Himself says as to what our homes ought to be and what future marriages and future homes ought to be like. You know, there's not a lot that I'm going to speak on either tonight or any other time that we have together that you're going to walk out of here and say, I've never heard that before. If you've been in church here, and I know that you've been having uh, these family conferences before, you've heard preaching and teaching on the home. You've heard preaching on the subject matters that we'll look at together scripturally. So there's nothing I can say that you've not heard before. So you're not going to go out and say, wow, that was new. No. It's, if it's new, it's probably not true because the truth is this book is the old, old gospel story and I find it extremely fascinating that the Lord God used marriage as an illustration of his gospel. You know, the relationship of, of husband and wife, it was used as, an, is it used as an illustration of us being the bride of Christ and Christ is the bridegroom. It's a glorious, glorious illustration. There's a book in the Old Testament that most pastors, <laughs> they may refer to it, but they never preach through most of the time verse by verse. Uh, it's, it's one of those books that would be difficult. It, the Song of Solomon. You say, why would that be difficult? Have you not read it? I mean, come on. <laughs> verse by verse, it would be a little on the difficult side. You say, well, why? Well, just go read it, and you'll see what I'm saying. But it is a glorious book that illustrates the relationship of a young husband and wife. And among all the illustrations it gives to us, it's an illustration of the love that the bridegroom Christ has for his church. It's a great book. And I would thoroughly encourage you this week to plan to be here for every one of our services. I said all that I've just said to say this to you. Folks, I don't look at these days as just being incidental are accidental, but I believe they're fundamental in us taking another step of protecting and as the dear family just saying, to get the blessing of God upon our homes. You and I get blind sometimes. We, we overlook things. I, I do. I'm just being transparent with you. I mean, there are things that I'm thinking to myself, Morris, 
Why do you have to keep being told these things? You know this. You know this Bible truth. And you know, the truth is we need a revival in our churches and we need a revival in our nation and we need a revival in Georgia and we need a revival in Atlanta. But I'll tell you where we really need revival. It's in our homes. And I believe with all my heart that if our homes would have a spiritual renewal and a spiritual refreshment and a spiritual revival, I believe our nation could receive some tremendous help as a whole if across this country there would be a return to you and me finding our biblical roles as husbands and wives, as dads and moms, as future husbands and wives, and as young people, as, as siblings, and as kids to their parents. I'm convinced tonight that we could impact this country more than what we have. So I'm, I said all that to say this. You need to be here tomorrow night. Now, I think I said this this morning. I'm not real sure. For those of you who are first time with us, let me tell you what. I think I said this morning, and if I didn't, I want to make sure I clarify it tonight, okay? This is what I tried to say this morning. And Boy, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I misstated this this morning. Remember now, tomorrow night is the most important night of the meeting, okay? I didn't even get a giggle out of that. I didn't even get, I, I got a couple of smiles. Now, if you didn't hear me this morning, I tried to get you to come back tonight. Now I'm going to say, come back tomorrow night. Don't miss tomorrow night. You say, well, I'll, I'll have to come straight from work. I'm sorry about that. I really am. I really am. If you, have to, if you have to meet your family here and they come in one vehicle and you come in another, and, and I'm sorry. You say, well, I'll have to pick up the kids from ball practice and then come straight here. I know. That could, be, that could be difficult, and I'm sorry for the, for the added miles on your vehicle. But would you do it? I would I ask you to consider doing it. You say, well, I, I'll come straight from work. I'll be in my uniform. Yeah, I know the feeling. I'll be in my uniform too. So you just come on, all right? Just come on. I mean, honestly. You say, but I work, I work at a place where I need to change clothes. Okay. You sit in the parking lot, and I'll yell real loud. But you just plan to come, would you? I, 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 really, I really mean that. You say, well, I, what if I can't come? Well, someone knows where you live. We're coming after you. So don't miss it, all right? I hope that you'll plan to be here. Really, I mean that. You say, I've never come on a Monday night. Well, then maybe this ought to be the week that you do that for the first time, all right? This is a great Sunday night crowd. I appreciate you being here. It's been worth being here just for the great music that we've had together tonight. Man, I love this. I just have loved this. It's been a sweet, sweet service. Yeah, hey, do you have a favorite Bible character? How many of you have someone outside of the Lord Jesus... You have somebody in the Word of God, they are your, your favorite Bible character. How many of you have a favorite Bible character? Yeah, I think a lot of us do. That doesn't make us a better Christian than somebody else. But, and they're just, there are certain people in the Word of God that just kind of rise to the surface. I, have, I think I have about, I don't know, 38 favorite <laughs> Bible characters. I just have a lot. But there are probably the top five or the top three people that I really love to read about. How many of you, let me just ask this, just raise your hand. How many of you would, uh, uh, you'd say David is your favorite Bible character? Would you hold up your hand? That's where my hand would go up. All right. How many of you would say Job is your favorite Bible character? All right. You got uh, two or three there. All right, Job there. How many would say Peter? Peter's your favorite Bible character. There are, these are the ones that people use to choose. Hey, ladies, how about this one? Esther. How many would choose Esther. Always ladies would choose Esther. Let's go ahead and get the other one. Ruth. Anybody claim Ruth? Yeah. yeah that's, that's a good one. I know there are other great ladies in the Bible. Hannah and some others in the Bible. Uh, uh, with Hannah in mind, how about Samuel? Anybody claim Samuel? Anybody? All right. Good. All right. Wonderful. Uh, uh, Jonah. Anybody, anybody think Jonah? Uh, 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 how about Paul? Oh, my. Paul. Paul. Oh, he's the man. Isn't he? I love the story. How about Joseph in the Old Testament? Anybody claim Joseph? Always, if I ever ask for people to speak out loud and tell me your favorite Bible character, I hear some of the names I just mentioned to you. But usually, early on, someone will say, Joseph, what a story. If you want drama, you got drama right in the Bible. You talk about a story that is almost a page turner. I know how it turns out, but whenever I turn to it in my book, in my Bible reading in the book of Genesis, I can't put it down hardly. It is amazing. The account of Joseph's life. Would you go to Genesis 39 with me tonight? In Genesis 39, we could start actually in chapter 30. 
to get the story of Joseph. But we're going to go to chapter 39. He was born in chapter 30. His life really takes off in chapter 37. And folks, his story goes all the way to the very end of the book of Genesis, chapter 50. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, it's a big deal in this order. Listen, there is more ta- there's more said about the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis than any other character in the book of Genesis. There's 25%, this is important stuff, 25% of the book of Genesis deals with the life story of Joseph. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, think about the other big characters in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve, Noah, hey, Abraham, I'm talking some big named people. And more is said about Joseph than any other character in the book of Genesis. You say, well, why is that? Well, I I don't know all the reasons why, but you've got to remember who wrote the book of Genesis. God used Moses to pen the book. All right, when did Moses hear about Joseph? Now, follow me. He heard about the story of Joseph after Joseph was dead and gone. Moses, Moses grew up at the feet of, of, uh, of Pharaoh's daughter, but more importantly, at the feet of his mom and dad, who told him how they got to Egypt. I mean, he grew, he grew up in Egypt. And he said, they, they probably said, now, now Moses, let us tell you about the greatest hero in the life of the Hebrew race. We want to tell you about Joseph. He was the great leader of Egypt in yesteryear. Listen, had they had uh, posters in that day, Moses would have had a big old picture. He would have had a big head of, of, of Joseph in his room. I'm just telling you. I mean, he was the Hebrew hero. He was something else. Everybody knew Joseph. But if there was ever a guy who came from a dysfunctional family, it was Joseph. If there was ever a guy who came from a, a home that really had some serious problems, it was Joseph. You may sit here tonight and you say, oh, preacher, you don't know. All this emphasis on the family. If you only knew what I'm having to deal with, and there are things I've kept from my church family, they don't know. Well, I got news for you. The Bible doesn't hold back anything. We find out a lot of things about Bible characters. That is another reason why we know the Bible is the word of God, because we see the ugly flaws in people's lives as well as We see the good points in their lives. Joseph came from a family that was truly what we'd call a dysfunctional family. It was messed up. Think about it. His dad had four wives. Do I need to go any further? Do I, I mean, I mean, is that no? I'm, I'm telling you, I don't mean he had one, then divorced her, and then got number two, and then got rid of her. I'm telling you, they were all there at the same time. Okay. Do you think that there might have been a few disagreements around in that place? I mean, just use your imagination. Don't get the idea these people were any different than us. I mean, they were all there. They were all, vi- they were all vying for the same man's recognition and attention. They were all f- trying to get his love and favor. Now, I know the Bible calls two of them wives and two of them handmaids, but they were all serving as the mother of his children. Get the idea? And all these boys begin to grow up from various mothers. They all had the same daddy, but they had different mothers, and all these boys begin to grow up in this home. And I'm telling you what, it was a mess. But the one woman that the dad loved the most, the one he loved the most, couldn't have a baby for the longest of time. And then finally, she's expecting a baby. Okay, here's the one woman of the four that the dad, the husband, the dad loved the most. What a messed up home. He loved her the most. And she's going to have a baby. And she gives birth to Joseph. Well, you, put, you fill in the dots, would you? You connect the dots. Joseph got baby treatment because he came from the special woman. Plus, he was the baby in the family. How many of you have been? How many of you are the baby of your family? Have you milked it for all of its worth? I'm telling you, just just get everything you can out of it. And the other brothers and sisters say, "My mom and dad treat you differently." That's when you kindly look at them and say, "Get over it," and then just move right on. I'm the baby in my family. But anyway, uh, the truth is, oh, Joseph was the baby for a while, and then baby Benjamin was born later on. My friends, listen to me. Joseph grew up in this home, and he was hated by his brothers. 
despised by his brothers. Listen, I know you know the story, but don't miss this. They, they plotted to harm him. They plotted to get rid of him. They plotted to destroy him. And they sold him off for how many pieces of silver? 20 pieces of silver and shipped him off to Egypt. Listen, they never expected to see him again. They thought he'd never make the journey. Probably, friends, probably the Ishmaelites which had bought him they, they put probably a leash around his neck and treat him like an animal. And he probably was pulled and yanked all the way down that southern road, all the way down to Egypt. And they probably looked at that 17-year-old boy as he was traveling down the highway, and they thought, he's dead. He'll never make it. He went down there. He was falsely accused, placed in a prison, came out of the prison years later and became the most powerful man on the planet because he was second in command to the one of the weakest pharaohs at the time, and Joseph truly had an authority in which he ruled the world. Would you follow me, please, in verse 1 of Genesis 39? It simply says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. It came to pass from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Did you know that Joseph is an Old Testament portrait, a picture of Jesus Christ? Did you know that? He's an Old Testament illustration. Friends, listen to me. Jesus Christ is found all over this book, from page one to page last. Jesus Christ, you can open this Bible up anywhere, and you've got a, you've got a bloodline directly to Jesus Christ. He's taught all over the Bible. And Joseph is a perfect example of Jesus Christ. Can I just throw things at you? Look at me. First of all, Joseph was greatly loved of his father, Jesus it was said of him, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, God the Father said. J Joseph was hated by his brothers and plotted to harm him. Are you thinking with me? Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not and they plotted to harm him. They sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus sold for 30 pieces of of silver. Joseph was considered to be dead. <laughs> they thought they'd killed Jesus too. They thought they'd gotten rid of him. Joseph rose out of the ash heap of a prison to become uh, the reigning monarch of his day. Jesus rose from the dead. He rules in heaven. Someday he's going to rule on this old earth again, my friend. Did you know that when Joseph was in prison, he had, the Bible said he was in prison. He had several prisoners, no doubt, around him. But the Bible only tells us about two prisoners, a butler and a baker. I'm not preaching on them tonight, but just, just get the illustration. Do you remember what happened? They both had dreams. And Joseph interpreted their dreams. And what did he say? He said to the butler, you're going to be restored. Can I use this word? You're going to be saved from this prison. He said to the baker, you're going to die. Jesus hung between two prisoners. One was saved when he said, remember me, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me. The other one refused Jesus. He died and went to hell. Joseph, the Bible distinctively tells us that he rose out of that, out of that prison and became the authority at the age of 30. Jesus started his ministry after, as he was baptized at the age of 30. I love this one. Hang on. Joseph was given a bride. You know what kind of bride she was? He, she was? You say, was she pretty? I don't know. Uh, you say, well, what kind of bride was she? She was a Gentile bride. She was not a Jewish lady. 
She came from Egypt. She was a Gentile bride. Are you thinking ahead? Jesus is being given a Gentile bride, my friend. That's us. And all God's people said, amen. That's us. One day, Joseph ruled and he said, I forgive you, brothers. I forgive you. And I'm here to take care of you. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden and I will feed you, and I will give you rest. My friend, Joseph is a beautiful Old Testament illustration of Jesus Christ. You know, I have a friend. Lynn and I have some friends that live in Kansas City, Missouri, and they have a, a little child, a son. I don't remember how old he was when this occurred. Probably three or four at the time. One morning, her, uh, 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 my friend and his wife were awakened on a Saturday morning with a knock on the door. They went over and opened the door, and there standing at the door was a local police officer. Well, that's kind of shocking to be awakened to a police officer at your front door. And they said, yes, sir. They said, the police officer said to the lady, he, he said, ma'am, do you have a, a little three, four-year-old boy? Yes. He said, is he in his room? Is he in his bed? She said, well, sure he is. He's in there asleep. He said, what did he go to bed in? What kind of pajamas did he have on? She described them, whatever they were, Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, you know, one of those great characters of the faith. Anyway, uh, he, he just, she described whoever it was. The police officer said, are you sure he's in his room? She said, well, he ought to be. He said, would you go check? My friend and his wife went rushing into the room and discovered that their boy was gone. He, they came back and they said, no, he's not here. Where is he? He said, it's because he's not in his room. It's because he's out here in my patrol car. He said, ma'am, sir, I just picked him up two or three blocks away walking down the street. Do you have any idea how, how he got away? <laughs> no. And they frantically went out there and grabbed their boy and discovered what had happened. His daddy, my friend, had taken his little three or four-year-old boy one day that week and just walked him outside in the, in the garage and was just teaching him, his, you know, doing things like dad and boys ought to do, you know, just talk. And he said, son, let me show you this. And he says, you push this button, push that button right there. He pushed, he goes, watch this. And the garage door just came right up. And he pushed it and it comes right back down. Well, the boy got up early on a Saturday morning, didn't know why mom and dad weren't up, but decided to go have some fun. So he stepped out in the garage, stood probably on a bucket of some sort, a chair, got up there, pushed the button, the garage door went up, decided to take a walk down the street and just took a walk as a little boy. Can you imagine? You say, I don't want to imagine. Yeah, I know. And from, I'm sorry to every boy and girl. Your moms will probably grab a hold of you as you leave tonight and not let you out of their grasp for the next several hours. Here's the deal. Can you imagine the frightening experience of saying, where's my child? I don't know of anything more frightening than that. But can I tell you, look at me square in the eye tonight. Can I tell you something? There's even a graver concern that I'm deeply concerned about tonight. And that's children of God. People are on their way to heaven. Christians who are seemingly void and missing the presence of Christ-likeness in their life. Friends, did you know that you and I have been called, not just, we've not just been called to Christianity, hear me, we've been ca called to be Christ-like. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, but we all with an open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, we are to be changed into the same image from glory to glory. What's the Bible say? The Bible is saying, as we look into the mirror of God's word, we are to become more and more like the Savior. Most of you know Romans 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Listen, you've been a Christian any length of time, you've grabbed a hold of that verse, but don't stop at verse 28. Verse 29 goes right over and it says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of Christ. Young people, are you listening tonight? Mom and dad, are you listening? We've been called to be like Christ. I used to sing a little song as a little boy growing up, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I ask, to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, all I ask, to be like him. Ron Hamilton, who wrote the song the family sang a moment ago, wrote that very familiar song, I saw Jesus in you. I saw Jesus in you. 
I could hear his voice in the words you said. I saw Jesus in you. In your eyes, I saw his care. Uh, I could see his love was there. You were faithful, and I saw Jesus in you. Look at me. It would be frightening to have a missing child. It ought to be equally as disturbing in Christians' lives tonight when Christ-likeness is missing in our homes. So I'm going to church. I'm going to heaven. I know Jesus Christ. I know, but is Jesus Christ seen in you? Brother Roger emphasized at least a couple of times tonight that we're to be hungry. The choir sang it for the spirit-controlled life, to be spirit-filled. Have you seen Jesus Christ? Those, listen, those who know you best, do they see Jesus Christ in you? People you work with, people you live with, people you interact with in your home. Is Christ's likeness there? I'm going to tell you something. Jesus was seen in the life of Joseph. You still got Genesis 39 in front of you? Look at verse 2. It says, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Verse 3, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. He had the hand of God upon his life. He had Christ's likeness in his life. Now, I'm going to tell you tonight, I'm going to go as fast as I can. I want to lay at least two things on your heart tonight. It's taken me a little while to get there. But I want to lay two things very quickly on your heart tonight that reveal Christ's likeness. Now, folks, this is sobering truth. Now, I hope you'll listen to me tonight. I'm going to give you right from the life of Joseph what ought to be evidenced in our homes and in our life if Christ's likeness is in truly in our life. Would you look at the very end of verse 6? At the very end of verse 6, an interesting statement is made. It says, and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. <laughs> what in the world does that mean? Joseph was a goodly person. If I ask you tonight, would you know what that means? Goodly person. You say, well, you say, uh, well, preacher, when a person is goodly, uh, what that means is uh, when you study the original language, the word goodly, uh, well, uh, uh, the fact that Joseph was goodly, it means he was um, good. That's what it means. He was good. Well, he was a good guy, but that's not what it means. Oh, he said, well, let me take the other one. He was well favored. Well, you see, when a person is well favored, what that actually means is to be well favored means to be, well favored means to be favored well. That's what it means. It means he had friends. Everybody liked JoJo. Well, that he was well favored. I'm sure he had friends. I'm sure he was well liked. But now come up close to the Bible and hear me tonight. That's not what it means. You say, well, what does it mean he was a goodly person? And well favored. Are you ready for this? this? It's almost embarrassing for me to say this, but I'm going to tell you exactly what it means. You know what it means? It means Joseph was a handsome guy. You say, what? Yeah, that's what it means. It means he was handsome. He was very attractive. He, he, he had an attractive, uh, strong build. He would really remind you a lot of, never mind. Uh, he was just an extremely strong guy, attractive young man. You say, preacher, that's not what the Bible, t yes it is. You say, why would the Bible say that in verse 6? Because of what happens in verse 7. Look at it. It says in verse 7, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wotteth or knoweth not what's with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Can I tell you tonight, folks hear me with sobering ears tonight, what I clearly see taught in the scriptures tonight that reveals a Christ-like character. Stay with me. Number one, there was the presence of purity in Joseph's life. 
Did you know what kind of culture they discovered Joseph was living in? The excavators. I have a book on my shelf back home. I, 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 they discovered several things. The excavators, uh, archaeologists digs have discovered that the culture that Joseph lived in, they discovered several things. Follow me. They discovered that in that day and age, no husband and no wife ever, ever was faithful to their spouse. Everybody lived a loose, careless Immoral lifestyle. Nobody was faithful to one another. I mean, I could tell you horrible stories that I read uh, of what they discovered. T terrible things. Nobody, nobody were, were faith. Nobody was faithful to their spouse. Second of all, they discovered that women in that Egyptian culture were highly immorally aggressive. Okay, do you need a further example than what you have right here in this, in this passage? This woman who went after Joseph? It was the norm. Women were extremely aggressive, which, by the way, is, is not the way God created the woman to be. Okay, here's the point. They, uh, Joseph was in a culture in which nobody was faithful to their spouse. He was in a culture where women were highly aggressive. You know what else they discovered? They discovered that the homosexual lifestyle was accepted, agreed to, and to some degree encouraged. Okay, listen to me tonight. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Joseph found himself in a culture that was as corrupt and as filthy and as immoral as uh, a modern day like today. Joseph was in Egypt, but Egypt was not in Joseph. Joseph had no church family. Joseph had no pastor. Joseph had no Christian friends to help him be held accountable. He had nobody that he could turn to and say, oh boy, pray for me. Whoa, the pressure's pretty tough at work today. He had, no, he had no parents nearby. He didn't have, according to the word of God, he had nobody except his heavenly father to turn to. And Joseph, in a world that was filthy and wicked and a world gone wild, Joseph said, I'm going to stay pure, Amen. and I'm going to live right. Now, folks, it's one thing to stand up here and to hammer this truth. It's another thing to try to help people tonight, and that's really what I want to do. We don't get help in this area today. You can't, you can't go to the grocery store without being bombarded with magazines on a magazine rack. And, and now, folks, I'm, I'm going to choose words carefully here because I know we have young ears in the room, but we, we need Bible help tonight. We are invaded upon in the eyes and in the ears with that which is unclean thinking and living. You, you can't even go to a, a mall while shopping in a mall without passing by certain stores without images of things in front of you and certain stores that you, you, you have to turn your eyes away from if you're going to stay morally pure. I've had young people tell me things that they've heard in a public school that would probably, probably curl your hair. The wicked filth of things that have gone on and talked about in a locker room or in the hallways or in the classroom, that's the common norm in the day in which we live. And then all you've got to do is further, for further reference, just let your TV run unchecked and just allow anything and everything to come into your home. And you'll see an agenda that is anti-God and anti-home and anti-Christian marriage. It will bombard you. And you'll be considered, you'll be considered someone who's uncaring and unloving if you don't wrap your arms around that which is against the truth and teachings of the scriptures tonight. Now folks, and I'm not here to scream and rant and rave and spit. I figure that's why hardly anybody's sitting near the front here. I, uh, I'm a little concerned about how hard I can spit. My point tonight is I want to get you to understand something. Listen, Joseph was in a culture that was pulling at him. Did you see how relentless it was? Look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, and it came to pass as she spake to Joseph, how often? Day by day. My friends, her attack was, first of all, sight-driven. Her attack was sight-driven. It says there in verse 6 that he was a good-looking guy. It says in verse 7, she cast her eyes on him. What does that tell us? It tells us that much of the immoral living that we are confronted with on a day-to-day -day basis attacks us through our eyes. 
I mean, that's what the entertainment industry and the Hollywood world has just con con continually contributed to our moral meltdown in this world. They, they have the look of angels and the morals of barnyard animals as they go and hop around from one relationship to another to another. Her attack was sight-driven. Secondly, her, her, uh, her, not only was her attack uh, sight-driven, her appeal was strategic. You say, what do you mean? Well, she, she waited till there was nobody in the house. Did you see that in verse 11? She waited till the particular moment when she thought she could get her guy to stumble and fall. And she went after Joseph. He was a challenge to her life, and she went after him to get him. And her approach was sustained. It was day by day by day. Did you know, probably many a person has thought, if I can just... If I can just hang in there and get married, can I say to every unmarried young person in this room tonight, college age, young adults, young people, can I say to you, let me tell you something. The idea there is if I can just, if I can just get married, temptation whoo, will go away. Oh, I got news for you. Temptation will always be there. You better learn how to prepare yourself for temptation and stand up against it for the rest of your life. Joseph was attacked. You say, well, he must not have been normal. I mean, for a woman to go after him like that, he just must not have been normal. Oh, he was normal. Just turn a few pages over. You know what you'll find out? Joseph got married, had a wife, and had two boys. Oh, no, he's as normal as any other male in this room tonight. But he said no. Did you look at verse 8? It says there in verse 8, but he refused. Can I tell you some things about Joseph's resistance? Now, listen, I'm just trying to be biblical. His resistance, I believe personally, his resistance, number one, was predetermined. I believe that long before the temptation, he knew what culture he was in. He knew where, I mean, he had been there since he was a young teenage boy. In the prime of his, of his development, he's, he's seeing all of this filth and this junk corruption going on around him. And as he's beginning to learn the language and he's beginning to see the aggressive nature of people to an immoral lifestyle, he's around it. And I'm as convinced as I can be that he predetermined his response. Why? Because, friends, you don't make the right decision in the heat of temptation. Are you with me? You've got to make up your mind but prior to the temptation. Here's what I will do when the temptation comes. Amen. What do you do? The Bible tells us to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What does that mean? It means to unplug the power of improper thinking. That means when walking down the hallway of a shopping center and you're walking along and all of a sudden you look up and you see something, you better think, what am I going to do when something like a magazine rack or something inappropriate or some inappropriate language comes around me? What am I going to do when it comes on the TV? What do I do? Predetermine your response. What's that going to be? Look away. Turn off the, cha change the channel. Predetermine your response. Joseph's, Joseph's resistance was, first of all, predetermined. Do you remember the story of Daniel? The Bible says that when he was offered the Babylonian food, what did he do? He purposed in his heart not to defile himself. What does that mean? He predetermined his response to the worldly influences. Now, stay with me. That means, friends... Ladies, men, young people, don't allow into your home all kinds of inappropriate, indecent, immoral teaching from the television screen. It's incredible to me what some Christians tolerate. And they say, well, it is what it is. I'm going to, you know, it's just, we just got to, we just got to live with it. It's the day in which we live. You allow yourself to become desensitized to a lifestyle that after a while you may start embracing. You say, oh, I'm, oh you, you're kidding me. No, it wouldn't happen to me. Joseph ran. Why? Because he knew the weakness of his flesh. My friends, hear me tonight. I'm not trying to cram my personal standards down anybody's throats. I've been in services where I have felt like some preacher has told me what to do rather than the word of God. And I have no desire to do that tonight. But the Bible says to allow the Spirit of God, are you with me? To walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Listen to the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit says to you, you shouldn't be watching this, you better listen to it. Turn the channel. Change it. 
bring your thoughts into captivity and say, I'm not going there. I'm trying to, I'm trying to help your marriages tonight. I'm trying to help your home tonight. It is a, it is a, a truth that is an uncomfortable. You say, preacher, I'm uncomfortable with you preaching on this. You ought to be the one preaching it. I'm not, I'm not comfortable having to deal with this, but tonight, friends, I've had too many, I've had too many disappointments in my world of, of people that I've known whose homes, whose marriages have been hurt, whose ministries have been ended. I've known too many missionaries and sorrowful things that have been hurt because they didn't make a predetermined decision of what they were going to do when faced with temptation. Not only was his resistance predetermined, I believe, secondly, it was principled. Look at verse, look at verse 9, would you? He said, to, he said to Mrs. Potiphar, There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? What was he saying? He was saying, ma'am, I can't do this because look at everything your husband has given me to do. I have great privileges, and I could be immoral with you. And I put into jeopardy. I put into jeopardy everything else that has come my way. I'm not going to go there because how can I do this horrible wickedness and sin against my God? Friends, I don't know of anything that, that will keep you, listen, as right with God as a holy fear and reverence of God. You, that, that spirit that says, I don't want to disappoint my heavenly Father. You see, when we talk about the fear of God, don't get the idea. Don't get the idea that I'm talking about some, oh, 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 oh I'm scared of death. God's going to hurt me. That's not what I'm saying. A fear of God is a holy reverence and a love for him that says, I don't want to disappoint him. I don't want to fail him. Joseph's resistance was predetermined. It was principled. Now hear me. And it was persistent. As relentless as she was coming after him, he was relentless in saying, no, no, and he ran. You know, most of adults would not understand this. I mean, you would understand it, but you're just not, maybe uh, you, you've not come in contact with it, but I'm privileged in the summer months of my ministry years to preach at summer teen camps. I preached to teenagers all summer long. Can I tell you that I've had many a teenager roll up their sleeve, at a summer camp, roll up their sleeve, and sometimes they don't even have sleeves to roll up, it's summertime, but they'll turn their arm over and they'll show me slash marks, cuttings. They're cutters is what the world calls them. The, I could tell you the story I hear from California to New England are all the same. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning, Brother Gleiser. I got up in the middle of the night. I didn't want to live. I just didn't want to live. I found some razor blades in the bathroom. I started cutting myself. But I guess I wasn't brave enough to take my life. And I've said, as I've looked at the, in the eyes of some youthful person, I've said, why would you do that? Why would you want to destroy your life? 99 times out of 100, here's what they say. I got involved with some person I shouldn't have gotten involved with. I started messing around with pornography. I started messing around with some girl, some guy. I let him take advantage of me. I started doing things with that girl I shouldn't have done. And I felt like a piece of trash. I know. That's exactly what the devil wants that young person to think. You're worthless. You're a piece of trash. Destroy your life. You see, here's what the devil does. Before a person gets involved with immoral failure, he says this. Go, do it, do it. You'll get by with it. It won't turn out bad. And then when a person gets involved, he says, you'll never get by with that. You might as well destroy your life. Get rid of your life. Satan's out to destroy a person's life. Am I looking at someone here tonight? Sir, listen, you're a married man. Never. Never, never, never flirt with another woman. Never. But never stop being the loving, flirting 
husband to your wife. Keep the home fires burning. Ma'am, don't ever allow yourself to be entertained or encouraged by the warm flirtatiousness of another man. You keep your heart for your own husband. Let's keep our homes right. Number one, there was the presence of purity. Can I, can I just have about 10 more minutes of your time? I want to hurry. Would you go to chapter 50? And let me show you one more thing in the life of Joseph tonight that I hope will be a help to us. At the very end of the book of Genesis, we read one more thing that marks Christ's likeness in his life. Look at chapter 50 and verse 15. It says, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead... They said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite or repay us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we, we be thy servants. Or they were actually saying, We be your slaves. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. I love this. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Do you see it? He spake kindly unto them. For, quick, for a quick review, you remember what the brethren, the brethren did. They hated Joseph. They mistreated Joseph. They were jealous of him. They sent him down to Egypt 25 years earlier. And Joseph is sitting down to Egypt and now he's the most powerful man in Egypt. And now the family has come down to Egypt and he's been feeding them. But now daddy is dead and the, bro the brothers are thinking, now Joseph's going to kill us. For sure, he's going to kill us. Because here's what they were thinking. We, we, that's what we would do if we were in charge. We'd probably kill whoever had done, done to us what we did to Joseph. And Joseph has the authority to have our heads chopped off. He's going to kill us. And so they send a messenger. I think it was the baby brother Benjamin, myself. And uh, they sent a messenger. Read this to him. Tell him that father said, please forgive the brothers. Don't kill us. And, and then the brothers walk in and they fell down. The Bible says they fell down on their faces. Do you remember earlier when Joseph had those dreams that his brothers would bow down to him? They, in those days they said, we will never do that. Oh, they got real good at it. And they fell down before Joseph. And they said, Joseph, we're sorry. Joseph, please, please have mercy. And the Bible says, Joseph wept. And he said, brothers, come here. Come here. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to comfort you. What you meant to do to harm me, God had a greater purpose for it. Can I just cut to the chase? Look at me. Can I tell you what I see in Christ's likeness in the life of Joseph? I've already covered the first one. The presence of purity. Now, folks, follow me. Number two, there was the absence of anger. He was not an angry, retaliatory man. Can I tell you how to have Christ's likeness in your world, specifically in your marriage, in your home? Stop being angry. You say, what? Stop being angry. You say, oh, what do you mean? Don't get angry with me while I'm talking about the sin of being angry. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but let it be that which is good to the use of edifying, making people better, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And stop grieving and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you've been sealed Unto the day of redemption, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Question, ma'am, sir, young person, to parents and to your siblings, let me ask you a question. 
you lose your temper. You find yourself getting angry at things. You find yourself lifting your voice to make a point. Do you rule the roost by raising your voice? Are you mad sometimes? You say, I'm getting there right now. Okay, just hang on. Joseph shows to us a perfect picture of Christianity, of Christ's likeness by the fact that, listen, when he could have been retaliatory, he could have been vengeful, he could have gotten revenge. <laughs> he almost didn't know what the brothers were talking about. He said, fellas, I forgave you a long time ago. There was gentleness. There was sweetness in his voice. Some people live with a sudden anger. I mean, you say the right things, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a sudden anger. For other people, there's a stubborn anger. They just dig their heels in. You're not moving me. You're more wrong than I am. They just dig their heels in. There's stubborn anger, and it's all sinful anger. Someone has said, speak when you're angry, and you'll make your best speech that you'll ever regret. Speak with anger. Can I show you how to have a sweet home? Cast aside those moments. Walk in the Spirit and say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be in control of my life. And when things don't go my way, help me, Spirit of God, to have what we started the service out with tonight. A sweet, sweet spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, in church. How about at home? With those people who know you best. I've had many teenagers say to me, you know, everybody at church thinks my parents, they think my dad's a great guy. They don't see him at home. Maybe some of you'd be embarrassed to let us see what you're like with those who know you best. I don't know. How often do you lose your temper? You say, I don't know. Is it more often than what it used to be? I wouldn't doubt it because that's what anger does. It intensifies. Because when people get used to a certain level of anger, after a while, they don't respond like they used to. So you have to notch it up to get the same response you got at this level. You have to notch it up some in order to get the same response you used to get down here. I've known businessmen who rule their businesses with a spirit of intimidation and people cower in their presence. What a, what a horrible kind of a situation to live in, to work under. Sadly enough, I've known some homes that way. Sadly enough, I've seen some churches, and I know yours isn't this way, that's guided by some angry pastor. And again, I know yours is anything but that. My friends, can I tell you something tonight? Christ's likeness has an absence of a retaliatory, angry spirit. Now, there's an anger towards sin, but there's not the kind of anger that's at a person that's tolerated. Joseph was a forgiving individual. Some people just blow up when things don't go their way, and everybody knows it. Other people clam up. You can just see smoke coming out. Mother walks around the kitchen, slamming the pantry doors and drawers. Kids say, what's mom saying? I don't know, but just give her some time. Like about three days, you know? Sometimes we blow up, sometimes we clam up, and after a while we start to beat up. And a lot of times it's because we have stored up. You say, what? We've stored up something, now hear me, I'm almost finished, that we will not forgive another person. Can I tell you what a lot, a lot of marriages, you know what a lot of marriages are struggling with? They have a web of unforgivenesses. He said something a month ago or 12 months ago or 12 years ago and she did this 13 days ago or 13 months ago or 13 years ago and there's this web of, well, I don't believe in divorce so I'll just gut it out. And we never forgive. 
we never forgive. You say, well, he's never asked me to forgive him. Can I take you back to the cross of Calvary and remind you that at the cross of Calvary, we were forgiven before we ever asked for it? You want Christ's likeness? Learn to give grace. What's grace? Giving people forgiveness when they don't even ask for it. Being willing to forgive. Releasing. You say, but you don't know what I've gone through. Of course I don't know what you've gone through. If someone's, someone has hurt, hurt you, hurt your family, hurt your marriage, release them to the Lord. Don't you try to be the one to get back. Let them go. Christ likeness forgives. Joseph, Joseph scratched his head at his brothers and he said, oh, you mean what you did to me 20 plus years? Oh, that? <laughs> Guys, I forgave you a long time ago. I don't even remember that. In fact, I'll prove it. He had two sons. He says, look at my firstborn son. You know what his name is? Manasseh. You know what Manasseh means? Forgetting. He goes, I forgot that stuff. When I had this boy, I saw the goodness of God in my life, and I said, I'm just going to forgive and forget all that junk of my past. Hey, here's my second son. His name's Ephraim. You know what Ephraim means? Fruitful. He says, guys, brothers, my life is it's fruitful with joy and peace because I forgave and forgot everything that I got mistreated for years ago. You know, there's a lot of Christians who know very little of a fruitful Christianity because they've never forgiven and forgotten. Is there somebody tonight you need to forgive? Do you need to let your husband go with forgiveness? Just let, just, I don't mean, okay, okay, I'll let it go. But I'll tell you what, if he ever one more time, I mean forgive. So it's over. Let it go. Preacher, if you only knew what she's like, I'm telling you, I could just, uh, just almost write the next chapter. What's going to happen? When I walk in the door, she starts... I just, I just can't let... Forgive. No anger. Is there somebody you can't talk to tonight? Let it go. I was preaching. I was preaching in Ohio many years ago and was introduced to a young girl after an evening service. Her name was Patty. Patty told me about her family. Can I tell you very quickly about her home? It was horrible. Her dad was a drunk. He came home and would slap Patty's mother around, and when Patty turned seven, he turned on her and started knocking her around the house as well. One night, Patty's dad came home, and Patty's mom took everything that dad owned, threw it out in the front yard, and said, you're no longer <coughs> welcome here. Get out of here. Patty told me that night, she said, and I was glad. Now, boys and girls in this room, please understand what Patty was about to say to me that I'm going to tell you was coming out of the mouth of a out of a girl who did not have Jesus Christ as her Savior. And she had a lot of hate stored up inside of her. She said to me, I was glad Mom kicked him out because I hate my dad. She said, but then my mom took me to my room, opened up a suitcase, took everything I owned, put it in that suitcase, walked me to the front door, and said, and you get out of here too. I don't want you around here anymore. I said, okay, Patty, I said, I missed something. How old were you? Seven. Your mom kicked you out of the house at the age of seven? Yes. Now, this was years ago. I know, it. I know today if a mother tried to do that, she'd truly be arrested. But can I tell you, that, way, that woman pulled it off somehow or another, and Patty walked up to the house of her grandmother who lived some distance away, walked up with a suitcase and convinced her grandmother to let her live with her. Her grandmother didn't want her around. Her grandmother said, I don't want you around here. But night after night, day after day, she continued to live with her grandmother. And I sat down with her on this evening after a service, and I said, Patty, if you died tonight, do you know that you'd go to heaven? And she looked at me and she says, I don't even believe there is a God. And I don't want to hear about your Jesus. And she told me the story, a lot more detailed than I'm telling you what I just told you about her family. And I realized I was listening to a girl who had no love in her life from around her or within her. And I said to her, I said, Patty, can I tell you about somebody who loves you with a never dying love? And I told her the story of God's never dying, unrelenting, everlasting love. 
I told her of how God gave his own son for her and died for her. And folks, every verse I gave her penetrated her heart even deeper. And she became so soft in her heart that I saw that bitter, angry girl begin to soften and have tears in her eyes. And with a gravel voice, she said, Do you think he even loves me? I said, I know he loves you. I said, would you like to accept him? She said, yes. And a girl who had just said to me a few moments ago, I don't even believe there is a God, was now accepting the Son of God. She accepted Christ as her Savior. She wiped her eyes. I wiped mine. We walked over to one of the assistant pastors, and she told him what she had just done, and we rejoiced. She was 21 years of age. She'd been around 21 years of hate. The next night I came to the service, I saw her outside by herself with a Bible. She didn't have one the night before. She was walking with a Bible, looking down at it. I asked her what she was doing. She told me how that the night before she'd gone home, she said, I couldn't go to sleep. After what, after what happened? She said, I just couldn't believe it. I said, yeah, I know. Isn't it wonderful? Jesus is your Savior. She said, I started reading the Bible. She said, I started reading all over the Bible. And she said, I found this book called James. She goes, she says, you didn't tell me about it. It's really good. I said, yeah. I said, it's all good. She said, well, I'm trying to memorize the whole book of James. I said, you mean the whole book? She said, yeah, I've only got a couple of more verses to memorize, and I'll have chapter one completely learned. She wasn't 24 hours old in the Lord. And I said, are you kidding? I said, Patty, is that all you've done today? Is memorize scripture? She said, no, sir. She said, I did something else today. She said, I went downtown today and I walked inside of a place of business. I walked up to a man who works there and I put my arms around him. She said, I haven't seen him in years. And I said... I love you, Daddy, and I forgive you. Please forgive me. Friends, I didn't tell her to do that. I just wanted her to get saved. But when she saw how much she had been forgiven, it was supernaturally natural to her to forgive her dad. She told me that night, tomorrow, I'm going to go see my mom. You know what I saw? You know what I saw in Patty? I saw Christ. Christ's likeness. Joseph is an Old Testament illustration of what Christ's likeness is all about. And I thank you for your listening tonight. But the thing I see in his life is a man who had the presence of purity and the absence of anger. May God help us to have the same spirit. Would you bow your heads, please? Father, please help us in the brief.